Hallo, dit is Arne Koets van de Kemenaten in Laugreuten. En ik ben asked by de Dreinschläger to make a video for this event. Now, of course, uh, last time I got uh, invited, uh, and I was very happy to be invited to do a workshop for a Drein event, I did something with Polax. And of course, I've uh, always enjoyed my Polax uh, techniques and, uh, and fighting uh, my armored combat on foot. And uh, I still do. However, I thought this was kind of a good opportunity to actually do something with horses this time. Because, of course, I also spend a lot of my time doing mounted fencing and various things thereof. Or mounted martial arts, I think I should say. Now, because, of course, bringing horses to the middle of Vienna is a, a bit complicated, uh, even just a demonstration would be tricky. And thereby, using this digital version might be the best opportunity to start looking into that. And what I particularly want to talk about is how mounted martial arts can give us a different insight in the medieval and renaissance martial arts in general, the European martial arts tradition. Um, there's so much to be said and I can't say all of it because they only gave me 20 minutes. However, uh, I want to make a few points that are particularly close to my heart. Now, of course, first of all, what is mounted martial arts? This is quite a broad set of things. Because first of all, you have skill at arms or various t versions thereof. And this means that you have uh, targets, usually stationary targets, that you gallop past and hit with various weapons, be it cutting cabbages with a sword or running at the ring with a lance, perhaps, um, and various things like that. You might be uh, hitting gloves or tent pegs in the ground next to your horse, hanging all next to it and all that kind of stuff. And then from there, you can even introduce guns. So traditionally, skill at arms is actually done with pistols as well, where you're using the report of the firearm to just burst some balloons as a competition. All of that combined into a parkour where you try to hit several targets in a, in a row. Now, of course, this then also leads into the next option, which would be mounted archery. Now, mounted archery, again, these days is mostly done as a fun and, and competitive thing. So we mostly look at the sort of fancy side of mounted archery, you should say, which makes sense. It's fun. And um, that is where you uh, gallop and shoot at the gallop or at the canter and uh, at targets that are in awkward position. So behind you, straight above you and below. Now, not all of these targets are necessarily direct analogs of what you would do in war. However, they are just to show off your skill and your independence of your weapon to your horse. And the horse is left a little bit more to its own devices during all of this. It's not as if you don't need to ride it. I mean, you do. Um, but the, you're mostly shooting from a horse that keeps on going, uh, either in a, in a prepared track or in some cases you, you do ride very large uh, circles or something and, and shooting from there. However, this very precise riding specifically is something you don't necessarily need for mounted archery. And it's also not necessarily how mounted archers were primarily used in warfare throughout history, which is a huge topic. But it's fun and it's, it really takes some skill. The people who do that well are just amazing at that game, tradition, um, sport, you name it. It's a martial art, for sure. It's art. Now then there is, of course, perhaps the most quintessential European martial art, if I may say so, and that would be jousting. Now jousting, of course, is two people riding at each other with lances. Now this is a bit more like actual fencing because before we had targets which were by and large stationary as well, but definitely not doing anything to dodge or to deflect or block or anything like that and very few of them would be moving at all. Now, with jousting, we definitely have a moving target and we have an opponent and we know we are gonna get hit as we do the activity, or very likely to. And that means that, of course, we have a psychological uh, impact and we also have to, well, literally brace for impact. So there is, there is that whole side of things for sure. So it's a lot more like combat as opposed to skill at arms to prepare for combat. That's not to say that skill at arms necessarily is very easy. You can make it as hard as you want. However, you're focusing on one element. 
In jousting, however, we are not dodging and we're not blocking, or we really shouldn't. We are supposed to take it, take what comes to us, and 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 be uh, be happy about it. And whilst we are giving out. That is specific to jousting tradition, and this is also historical. So jousting as a competition does not look in any way, shape or form like a modern competition. Um, even though people try to make that out, it really is a different thing. Now, and then we get to perhaps the first section where you can start calling an actual mounted fencing, if you will, and that would be tournier, the tournament proper. You could call this melee, I suppose you could call it bohoort, but again, of course, that phrase is now used for other things. But it is where you have two mounted teams in full armor, usually with wooden heavy clubs that go at each other as a team, or blunted swords, or both. And that means that you can have team tactics, you have the, the mess of not being able to see behind you and being attacked from all sides and multiple opponents ganging up on one. And we don't really know what the rules were, but it seems as though there were very few rules because it was impossible to enforce them anyway, because it was such a mess. And um, this might have as historically as many as 400 participants at one time. Definitely uh, around 200 is several times uh, depicted. We've done it with up to 12, which was already quite hard. Now, that means that you're bashing each other rather hard. And um, you might think that there's no thrusting, but there is records of use people using clubs and thrusting with them, wrestling, using them like daggers, whilst wrestling, on horseback. All of that is depicted and all of that is recorded. But this is still relatively large, relatively controlled events at the time and usually when we reproduce them they're even more controlled we might for instance use a tilt rail to make sure that the horses know where they're going and cannot collide so easily however you can up the ante one more and get closer to the actual combative reality and this is what was known as à l'outrance yeah, until the utmost um, or joust of war, same concept, where you ride without a tilt rail. So all these things that are kind of sportive aids, um, potentially more armor, more specific armor, um, the tilt rail itself, obviously a prepared field to make everything easy for each other, that is not around in war or in duels. So um, a joust of war very much fudges into the judicial duel territory as well. This is very difficult to draw the line between the two. And we have reproduced those as well. And that's where you start aligning yourself, but there's still a sort of um, an agreement to meet in the middle with most of these displays. So and at least when we did jousting with real lances, with sharp heads, uh, we very much agreed to meet with the lance strike. But then we carried on with blunt swords in a free flowing competitive sense from there. So, but that all still is somewhat restricted in your martial ability to make a tactical decision. And then we have mounted fencing per se. So that is really what I'm trying to talk about here. So there's all those other martial arts, which is also European historical martial arts in their own right, and all have very much a place to, to be. And, um, and But I'm just being specific about the fencing on horseback. Um, and this can be done with lances, or with swords, or with warhammers, or you actually just wrestle. And frankly, there's also daggers involved um, in some of the manuscripts, they're not a great deal. And uh, that means that we, we need to uh, play with approaches and how to use the weapons and things like that. And we, we, can, we can really have some fun on horseback. But of course, you need to do the riding as well as the fencing at one time. And uh, that means that, of course, we have a we have a bunch of things that we do usually uh, in the world uh, agree that we don't like doing. For instance, there is a manuscript that specifically tell you how to kill your opponent's horse. Yeah, we we don't do that one. We don't even do that with a rubber weapon or anything like that. Obviously, we don't want the horses to um, get afraid or suffer or be hurt. For God forbid. So that is definitely not on. And also, uh, it is taken as the responsibility of the combatants and the riders to, of course, avoid that the horses might be struck accidentally as well, obviously. I mean, it might sound really obvious, but it is a really big deal. And of course, we need to control a very complex environment to make sure that that doesn't happen.
But also we need to control our own uh, fervor as we fence. Uh, we need to control our own fervor so that we don't apply the weapons too harshly on our opponent. Also kind of obviously, but more importantly, when we're trying to beat somebody up who's yeah, wearing a fencing mask, you can take a bit of a hit in the face. I might be quite targetly really going for his face going, well, I'm allowed to hit that a bit harder. But then if my left hand holding the reins of my horse is also vervent because I'm using all these forces, I'm of course not allowed to pull my horse in the mouth either. So I can't have my hand yanking up because I'm so distracted with my weapon that I don't notice that my hand is just uh, yanking on the curb bit of my horse, hurting my horse's mouth. That would absolutely not be a way that we would want to... Um, uh, ride our horses. So we sometimes need to bear that in mind and uh, of course uh, uh, further the idea that that is just not acceptable in this day and age. Similarly to for instance the throws of the horses there is descriptions of how to throw the horse over so that the rider will be crushed under his horse. We don't practice those either because it's not very nice and also it would be rather dangerous obviously. So um, there is a little bit that we need to kind of hold back in the interest of the horses, but it's not a big sacrifice, to be honest. Um, control is nice in martial arts anyway. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's go on to some ideas on how to get approaches. So apart from the weapons we might be using and the things we might be doing with mounted fencing, there's one specific thing that is needing to be considered. We can't just ride straight at each other because the horses would crash quite simply and the horses don't like to do that anyway so we need to find other solutions. This means that we have two major classes of opportunity. Frontal attack which is unter Augen or attacks from behind. Now when I'm attacked from behind there's still the distinction between being attacked from the left or being attacked from the right. And this means that when I'm attacked from the right, I have some opportunity to just turn in the saddle and still ride in the regular direction and use my weapon relatively okay. However, if I'm attacked from the left, this is really awkward, especially when trying to not do silly buggers with my reins. I can sort of defend, but it's very ineffective because you can just kind of call a shot right next to the defense. However, even though I might then engineer the maneuverability of my horse to have my opponents opposite me, frontally, unter Augen, I could still have my opponent on my left or on my right. So right side to right side or left side to left side, as we tend to call it. Now with lances, left side to left side is a lot more interesting than with swords. I mean, you can do it, but it's awkward. We'll see some interesting uses of fighting to the left side, however. With swords, you usually fight right side to right side, to the point where they actually shorten the right stirrup, because they're going to turn right so much when fighting with swords. They are actually mentioning this in the sources. Now, however, when we do this, not only are we passing each other by, we also need to project our weapon on a, some angle to where we are going. Now, this would normally be a little bit awkward, because what we usually do in, in martial arts is keeping our opponent in front of our chest so we can project our, our attacks and defenses so we have a good structure to work with. However, on horseback, the odd thing is that we usually have very hard hits if we're not careful. We tend to hit harder on horseback than the same person would hit on foot, even though they're using it one-handed and even though they have all this other stuff to deal with. So they might not always be quite so on the money with their technique. So why is it that we have so much more force? So it could be a choice of weapon. If you use a saber, you know, that hits hard. Well, what if we don't use a saber? We use the same weapon, like a long sword. You still see that the same person hits harder on horseback. And this is odd, because quite often we might be traveling in one direction and projecting our sword in another. So this would normally be seen as a relatively weak way of doing things. Now, of course, we have the speed of the horse, but this might be very fast or very slow. But of course, if I just hold a sword out and I ride into, say, a cabbage on a post, which is often displayed, this will go straight through with no effort whatsoever. Or you just hold your sword out and ride into people and they go to the hilt 
I mean, really easily. Just because of the speed of the animal, giving you basically a projectile that you happen to be holding. Okay, sure, but what if that's not the case? For instance, when we're circling around each other and we don't actually have a speed towards the opponent, why do we still hit them so hard so easily? And this is an interesting biomechanical conundrum. And it turns out that it has to do that even though the horse might not be traveling towards the target in any way, shape or form at all even, it's still moving a lot. So in order to sit on that movement of the horse, I need to move my hip a lot. So my muscles are keeping me in motion to be harmonic with the horse. And in doing so, I'm already needing to buffer his motion and generate forces and energy inside my body anyway. Now when I channel this to my weapon, I end up hitting really hard, even though I might be traveling in that direction and striking that direction. My hip is moving, my shoulder blade is moving, my sword. And this is also useful that we don't necessarily need to use our wrist so much. So this means that we get very high forces by use of the shoulder blade and by use of the hip. But what this does mean is that we are connected to the rhythm of the horse. And horsemen will see that coming because they train their most of their horseman life or horsewoman life looking at horses and predicting what the animal is going to do based on small cues in their uh, movement of their anatomy. So what we'll see is that I, the rhythm of my horse belies the rhythm of my fight. So I need to deal with that in a tactically different way. I need to assume that my opponent can largely see coming what I do and I need to have a tactical approach that it doesn't matter that my opponent knows what I'm about to do or at least what I'm initially about to do. That I can cover whatever he's about to do and then monopolize on there from there in whatever way. So that means that I need to approach it tactically differently, biomechanically differently, but all these things can be used on foot to generate power in angles you wouldn't normally be able to generate power by using pelvic alignment, hip thrust, shoulder blade use, using the back train of your body to generate power from your weapon. But first, let's have a look at some lance work. So, lance work against infantry, however. Now, this is using a relatively short actual lance size in combination with a footman using a specific technique from Fiora with a spear that is the right length for that particular weapon in the manuscript. So what we see here is that the rider is coming at the opponent using the lance and we're first letting the infantrymen do their technique as they see fit uh, in order to uh, allow the infantrymen to figure out the footwork which is really quite specific uh, in the manuscript, even though there's two different versions in the different manuscripts of Fiori. So, now this is a bit of an awkward angle, but you can see that the spear that I'm using there is going away from the horse's head in order to defend and then counterattack using specific footwork. Now we'll do this again from the other side. And this is basically just to give you some idea of what we're attempting. Now, when the opponent, the rider, is not really doing anything fancy, it is obviously very easy to deflect the lance and then give a counter thrust. But I need to use quite significant footwork. And here we see that executed again. And here the rider is, of course, cantering. And there is a fairly good shot to be had for the infantryman. So that looks pretty good, isn't it? But already when I'm coming here at Nick, with my horse, I'm making it a lot harder for him and he's not able to step in as he would have liked. Now, this is where we get into Durchwechseln. Once the rider starts using Durchwechseln with the lance, which is so often described with lance work, then we have a lot of opportunity because we simply have a length advantage and a mobility advantage and we decide when to attack and we can Durchwechseln in several different ways and quite easily get a hit especially in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So here it's me trying to defend and I'm stepping off quite a lot more and I still get hit really quite nicely in my stomach by Isaac there. Now there's another thing I can do. I can come in with a levé. I can smack the lance in more, which makes it much harder for my opponent to defend. Now notice here that there's still quite a lot of distance between the, the spear and my horse. I can 
leave quite a bit of distance as I see fit, especially due to the length of the lance. Although horse lances get a lot longer than this. Now in here, this is another approach. He can use his horse to attack me and you can see how easy that is for him. He keeps control over my weapon and he could easily have run over me if he wanted to. He's just holding back uh, his little stallion there. So you can see that there is several things that we get to do that are often ignored because it's there's of course always a counter in martial arts and there is here as well. We have several at our disposal as riders against this particular technique that is quite famous. So then we are going to fence with lances between two riders. So in this case we need to start aligning ourselves and like I said with lances we have a lot better opportunities to attack on our left or on our right. But when the opponent has a lance he can also use it to defend himself. So as opposed to jousting where you just take the hit, here we're kind of trying mostly be deflecting the opponent's lance and then seeing if we can get a line to attack. Now the thing of course when we're fen fencing with this in sparring is that when you connect it can really connect quite hard so we are being rather careful. So sometimes we're just kind of pointing that we could have hit. Now first we start off with just couched lance work, which is by far and away the most what you do with the long heavy lances of the medieval period. And uh, then we see some more intricate stuff later. So here I'm coming in and I'm collecting my horse to see if I can get an angle. And then I'm here we have the slow motion so I'm doing a little Durchwechseln so I can attack him there. And I use the side here because I didn't want to pile it into his uh, fencing mask so much. This is a specific type of turn that you do. I cross across his line, re reposition my horse, and now I defend, attack his head, and he just simply lifts his lance and leans out of the way. But this means that he cannot attack me in this particular moment. He managed to defend himself, so though. So there's a few things that you can do there. And here we're using actually the back of the lance to defend and actually attack the rider in a sort of a wrestling type of fashion where you're trying to wash align him off the horse. This is specifically mentioned. So you can also use the back of the lance to defend with it. Or for instance, you can drop your reins and use it two-handed and come in there. And this dropping of your reins is done usually rather late. So you need your reins to try and get the best position you can get. However, uh, when you uh, do this, you might find that you uh, need to um, do this at the last moment because you want to get a nice line and then allow the horse to carry on doing its job. Now the next is we're going to fence with some swords. And what you, uh, what you probably see here is that the exchanges are very, very short. We do a lot of maneuvering and then there's very short, relatively furious exchanges. And in this first section, this is a, a relatively inexperienced fighter who is uh, getting used to the horse as well. So I'm having a bit of a field day here, I must say, um, being able to use several different techniques. And you see that there's a lot of single time um, attacks. So a lot of Vazetson is done with. Uh, attacks that are also covering the line and I'm able to uh, attack him in various different ways with thrusts and strikes. But there's a lot of specific positioning and angles that kind of give me different opportunities to uh, be able to apply different techniques. So here I'm turning around, he's already behind me but it's very easy for me to make that little turn and have him again in front of me. And he's trying to do a touch and how, and I can just overbind as by the book. This is the by the book defense against that. Now I could have kind of pursued him a little bit more, but I couldn't be bothered. And again, I'm trying to get a frontal attack here. And then as he comes in, I can defend and I can thrust forward there. Now, because there was a bit of a bounce in the swords, I didn't really keep the bind, but I had the line and I had my opposition, so I didn't really care. So next we're coming in here and I'm using a shield how type of attack and I'm just kind of over binding from there. And, and then again, I'm turning left here and resetting my horse. And this is why I need to defend more or less cron like. And then I just try to do a track how like motion to, to the back of his head because I was kind of still busy riding my horse. And that's why I was doing something rather simple. And then here we see something that is very common uh, on horseback, which is the Turkish ahau, the Turkish cut, which is essentially a type of schnappen, where you attack and you attack again. We'll see this in a bit more detail in a moment. And I did a follow-up motion with the back of the sword there, with the short edge. Um, so 
I strike at him and then I can just do a Durchwechseln from there as well. Especially once he started being invited to raise his sword higher and higher every time I attacked at his head, then of course the Durchwechseln is a very good option. And here I can actually just go around again and do a strike uh, from there. Now this is a, a section where we see an attack on the left side, although the other side was on the right side. And here Isaac is turning very aggressively inside, managing to block with his cross guard, getting a thrust, and then getting this turn in between the other stallion, and then attacking from behind and being able to approach his opponent from behind. Now you can see that that takes a lot of commitment and it's very easy to screw up. So now we're seeing that this is this schnappen type motion, Turkish Ahau, and we see that very often this is used. So which one is attacking, which one is defending, it's sometimes hard to tell, and it just looks like crossing the swords, and this is very easily defaulted to on horseback. And here when we turn around each other a bit more, I can use the short edge of the sword to make another attack either at the head or at the back. So um, this is something we see a lot of, and it's the closest we get to parry riposte. And here we just have a little fencing match, and you see that we have a little bit more of a furious exchange here, quite simply because we stayed in measure, cantering very close to each other, because we both thought we could get each other. And there I rather haphazardly break off the fight, but the point being that we uh, could do these hits and then these durchwechseln there. So, there we've seen some mounted fencing, some sparring, and some use of weapons. Of course, I started off talking about primarily about power generation and things like that. However, what you might have also noticed is that there is a very deliberate approach of the opponent and a sort of a, almost a consensual meeting. Now, once this starts happening, when people know that it's inevitable that there's going to be a fight, there is going to be a very different type of fight due to uh, the mounted fencing reality in that you need to do a committed attack because if you want to wait for your opponent, you can't really hover in the distance and see what you're going to do and then snipe from a distance. That's not really an opportunity you have. You're going to be in the thick of it immediately. Now, this is interesting in that sense, is that it is very much the type of fighting we see in Fiore and we see in Lichtenauer, in a very general sense at least, even in Jodler Hush. So we see that people, even on foot, had the mindset of coming in uh, really rather committed and using attacks that threatened and closed lines at the same time. So either upsets and type of things or Meisterhauen, for instance. Now this is used very much on horseback as well, quite simply because you don't have time to make decisions on going from Perry route to Riposte, for instance. Now, of course, there is then follow-up attack. So you might do a Tornhau and then wind and then overbind with a Mutieren type of, uh, type of movement or various things like that. But this is when you're already very much in the thick of it and passing each other by um, in similar sort of committed approaches like you would do with a Durchlaufen, for instance. Not that it's the same thing. So we see that there's a very committed sort of type of combat. Now, this is also important when you fight in groups on foot. Now, when you do that, doing an approach with a whole group at once, when you don't necessarily, with your opposite number in the enemy's ranks, necessarily have your optimal moment to attack, but you're doing it when your unit decides to push, means you get a very different fight. And this is also, of course, done on horseback and warfare at the time as well. So this mindset allows you the flexibility to be effective as part of a unit, as well as an individual. It allows you to fight well on foot, in armor, out of armor, on horseback, or away from horses, fighting against horses on foot, or vice versa. All these different scenarios, if you're going to have one major game plan that you're going to teach people, they, this game plan kind of fits with them all. There's definitely a risk involved, but then there is the risk involved with every game plan. And I suppose this is why we see this so much emphasized in the earlier manuscripts and as opposed to the later manuscripts, where you see a lot more sort of gaming the distance becoming more and more important as time goes on. So I just wanted to point a couple of those things out, and I hope it's uh, useful to you all, and then I wish you a very good time. Thank you very much.